welcome everybody. This is 7.4, there we go. Okay, now we're gonna focus on finding the trig functions of any angle on the unit circle given a coordinate x, y. So let beta be an angle in standard position and x, y denote the coordinates of any point except the origin on the terminal side of an angle. If r, the radius denotes the distance from 0, 0, the origin, to the point x, y, then we can divide, define the six tree ratios. So just draw a lovely picture here. And here's our coordinate plane or even our unit circle. Here is the origin, zero, zero. And if we have our initial side of an angle and then our terminal side of an angle, what we're saying is that if we are given the point zero, zero, and then a point on the terminal side as the point x, y, then what we can do is form a right triangle <clears throat> where the base is x, the height is y, and the hypotenuse is going to be known as r. And given theta, which is on the terminal side, put that in green. From this angle of theta, we now can put these six trig ratios in terms of x and y. I kind of mentioned this last time, or I mentioned it a lot last time. Sine is related to y and cosine is related to x. So now instead of making ratios out of A, B, and C, we're gonna make ratios out of X, Y, and R. So what that looks like is first we have cosine of angle theta, which is gonna put X over R. Sine of theta which will put y over x, and then tangent of theta, which will put y, I know, sorry, I messed up the last one. Oops, I was even thinking of tangent, my bad. y over r, and tangent will put y over x. Okay, and then all we need to do is find the reciprocal functions. So here you would have the reciprocal of cosine is secant. So secant would just make it r over x. The reciprocal function for sine is cosecant, which would put r over y. And the reciprocal function for tangent is cotangent, which would put x over y. So these are the six trig ratios based on a point given on the terminal side of an angle whose origin is at zero, zero. Okay. And we will use these ratios, or we will use these, yeah, we will use these trig functions to help us find those ratios given any point anywhere on a terminal side. Okay. And some things given. If x is zero, this means that the tangent and secant functions are undefined because if x is zero, you'll get a zero in your denominator, which you can't have. Okay. And then if y is zero, this means that cotangent and cosecant will both be undefined because you can't have zero in your denominator. All right, well, based on that, let's try an example out. This says, find the exact values of the six trig functions of theta given a point on the terminal side. 
So we are given a point four negative three. Actually, I found something else. I can make this. Oh, no, never mind. Can't make that. I can make this. There we go. Learn something new all the time. So there is my coordinate plane, which can also be considered my unit circle. And then I draw my angle. So here is the center at the origin. And then here is my initial side. And then if we have the point four, negative three, what quadrant would that put us in? Well, four negative three, remember, is the coordinate x, y. And if x is positive but y is negative, this means we have to be in quadrant four. So there's our terminal side. And then we are just looking at the point given. Here is four, negative three. And with that being said, we can form our right triangle. I'll put my angle of theta here and label my triangle appropriately. Since x is four, the base here will be four. The height down below will be negative three. And this is a special case triangle or by Pythagorean theorem. We're going to get a three, four, five right triangle. And now we know all the sides of our triangle, which means we can find these six trig ratios. And it is okay to have negative three as the height because we're basing it off the point. We know height can't be negative. But in this case, we're going to have to make it okay. Okay, so this means we'll start with cosine of that theta. So say cosine of theta, you're going to put the adjacent side as 4 over the hypotenuse of 5. And then sine of theta. It's going to put the opposite side, negative 3, over 5. And then tangent theta is going to put opposite over adjacent. So we'll get negative 3 over 4. And the rest is easy. You just find the reciprocal functions. So secant theta is going to be 5 fourths. Cosecant theta is going to be negative 5 thirds. And cotangent theta is going to be negative 4 thirds. And that's it. That's how you find the six trig ratios of a point given on the terminal side of an angle anywhere on the coordinate plane or unit circle. All right, not bad. All right, so we were doing that on the last section, except we were doing it in terms of A and B, right? Now we're doing it actually in terms of X and Y. Okay. So this chart is, we're just gonna reference the circle the unit circle, because I have it right there, and just find out what are the ratios of quadrant angles? What are the six trig ratios of given quadrant angles? And remember, quadrant angle is an angle that lies on the y-axis or x-axis. So here, pi over two, pi minus zero, and three pi over two, are all quadrant angles because they lie on an actual axis. So all we wanna do is find the six trig ratios based on their points. 
So we'll start with zero degrees and the sine of zero degrees. Remember, we're calling on the unit circle now. We say sine of zero radians or sine of zero degrees and sine always outputs the y value. So sine of zero is zero. And then we say what's cosine of zero degrees or zero radians? Cosine relates to x, so cosine will output one. And then we say what's tangent? Tangent puts y over x. Tangent puts zero over one, sine over cosine, which gives us zero. And then we want cosecant. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if sine is zero, there is no reciprocal of zero. So the reciprocal of zero is gonna be considered undefined. And then secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Well, the reciprocal of one happens to be one. And then cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent. Is there a reciprocal to zero? No. So once again, we will be undefined. And the reason we're finding these is because on the last section, we found the six trig ratios of pi over 6, pi over 4, and pi over 3. Now we're finding them of the actual quadrant angles. So we know all the ratios of all the actual radian values and degrees. Okay. Now we start with pi over 2. And we look at pi over 2 and we say, what is the sine of pi over 2? And remember, sine calls on the y value. So the sine of pi over 2 is 1. Cosine of pi over 2, or 90 degrees, is 0. This time, tangent puts y over x, and it puts 1 over 0, which happens to be undefined. And then the cosecant at pi over two, cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. So if sine is one, the reciprocal of one is one. Secant is reciprocal of cosine. Since cosine is zero, there is no reciprocal to zero. So you get undefined. And then cotangent puts x over y. So cotangent puts x over y, so cotangent puts 0 over 1, which means we'll get 0. Now, if tangent's undefined and cotangent 0, could we say the reciprocal of undefined is 0? Hmm. I wouldn't, but we could. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> Now we're on to negative one, oh, negative one zero, we're at pi, and the sine of pi is zero. The cosine of pi is negative one. The tangent of pi, tangent puts uh, sine over cosine, so y over x, you will get zero, and you'll still get undefined. And secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So the reciprocal of negative one is still negative one. And then cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, which is zero. There is no reciprocal. So you're going to get undefined. And last, we look at 3 pi over 2. So <clears throat> sine at 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. Cosine at 3 pi over 2 is 0. You will get undefined. You will get negative 1. And then you'll get undefined. 
and then you'll get zero. Okay, perfect. And these values, zero degrees, also goes for uh, two pi radians and also 360 degrees. We'll say the share the same exact values at those quadrant angles. And the reason they'll share those exact same values is because they have a special name. They're called co terminal angles. Two angles are said to be coterminal if they share the same terminal side. What does that mean? Well, we draw a graph and let's say that here, oops, nope. Click off, there we go. So in this graph, of course, our angles always have our center at zero, zero. So let's say that here's angle A. I'm just gonna put angle A in the first quadrant. But then angle B comes along, and let's say, oops, let me change that color. Here's angle B. They uh, share the same initial side, yes. But then, <clears throat> let's say for angle B, I do a couple of revolutions. I say, all right, angle B will rotate once, will rotate twice, and we'll stop here on the same terminal side as angle A. So what this means is that angle A and angle B are coterminal because no matter how many revolutions B does, if it lands on the same terminal side that angle A has, In these two values, their angle values will be equivalent. So this is what it means to be co-terminal. Two angles share the same terminal side, no matter how many revolutions you do. I could even do negative revolutions. If I said, let's introduce an angle C. Then from the initial side, let's say I rotate this way. We're now in one negative revolution, two negative revolutions, three negative revolutions, four. And if I land on that same terminal side, we have to land on the same side. This means that angle A, B, and C would share the exact same values, only because they landed on the same terminal side. Okay. We do one more example. Let's see. Nope. Yeah. All right. Once again, let's say I have. Let me pause for a second. Okay. So just another example of being coterminal. <clears throat> there's my origin, there's my initial side, and then let's say I have an angle in the third quadrant. So here will be my angle A, and then for my coterminal angle, let's say Here's my initial side for angle B. And then, like I said, we'll keep this one really simple. Let's just say that angle B goes like this, shares that terminal side. Oops. 
And this means that angle A and B are once again coterminal. Doesn't matter if it's a positive revolution or a negative revolution uh, or a positive angle or negative angle, as long as they share the terminal side, they're gonna share the exact same values of that terminal angle, of that terminal side. Okay. All right, <clears throat> and to find a coterminal angle, well, one thing you can notice is that if it asks you to find a coterminal angle, it's gonna give you an angle that is way over a revolution or way under a revolution. And our job is to take that angle and put it back into the actual unit circle from zero to 360. And this will show us what the actual coterminal angle is equivalent to. So in order to do that, <clears throat> if it's given in degrees, we will add or subtract 360 degrees until we can come back in the actual unit circle from zero to 360. If it's in radians, then we will add or subtract two pi radians until we come back into the unit circle. And the reason we do this is because we want to show that no matter if it's coterminal, it will share the exact same value with an angle that belongs in the unit circle in that revolution zero to 360. Okay, because coterminal angles have the same terminal side, it follows that the values of the trig functions of coterminal angles are equal. So that just makes, maybe sounds more compl complicated, maybe it doesn't. And it's basically what I've been saying is that no matter what, how many revolutions you do and you land on the same terminal side, you will share the exact same values with an angle that's actually in the unit circle from zero to 360 degrees. Okay. So <clears throat> let's try it out. The first a uh, coterminal angle given is the sine of 390 degrees. Now, what we want to ask ourselves is, is 390 degrees within the normal unit circle? And that answer is no. The reason being is because it's over 360 degrees. So 390 degrees, if we use the unit circle, 300, let me see, I'll try that. So if we had our initial side here and we had 390 degrees, this means we went a full 360 and then an additional 30 degrees, which would put us right here. So what we're trying to say with this is that, and I know mine's not showing any degrees, I should probably pick a different unit circle, but you guys should have your unit circles with you to know what the degrees are at I over six. So what we're trying to say is that 390 degrees shares the same terminal side with 30 degrees, which means whatever trig function we were given is gonna share one of these exact values. That's all we're saying here. So now if we go and actually apply the math other than drawing swirls, we go up to three sine of 390. And to find out what angle is coterminal with 390 that actually fits in the unit circle, you would say the sine of 390 degrees minus 360 degrees. The reason we subtract that is because we know it's over a revolution. And this would give me the sine of 30 degrees, just like I showed on the unit circle. Now, if you reference your unit circle, well, you should be referencing your unit circle, what is the value of sine at 30 degrees? The value of sine at 30 degrees is going to be one half, that's it. So what we're saying by coterminal angles is that the sine of 390 degrees 
and the sine of 30 degrees are coterminal. So no matter what, since these angles share the same terminal side, the sine of 390 and the sine of 30 will always be equal to one half. That's it. That's all we're saying. Okay, so I guess we're just trying to show an equivalence between angles. So let's try it again with the cosine of 420 degrees. Is that over revolution? And that answer is yes, that's definitely over 400, I mean, 360 degrees. So what we would do is say the cosine of 400, that's too big of writing. No. The cosine of 420 degrees minus 360 degrees would give me the cosine of 60 degrees. And reference your unit circle, and the cosine of 60 degrees should be 1. Okay, so based on your unit circle, cosine of 60 is one half. So by coterminal angle theory, cosine of 420 is the same as the cosine of 60. They both share the numerical exact value of one half. Okay, moving on. Tangent of nine pi over four. Is that over a revolution? If you have no idea, well, one trick is to count radians, which means ignore the nine for a second and just imagine it's pi over four and start counting pi over fours like it was a, a watch on your wrist, just like any old clock, right? So what I mean is when I say count radians, you start at zero and then you add pi over four and then you add another pi over four, which would give you to two pi over four, which is just pi over two. And then you add another pi over four, which would get you to three pi over four. And then you add another pi over four, that would get you to pi, because that would give you four pi over four, which is pi. And then you add another pi over four, and you get five pi over four. And then you add another pi over four, and that'll get you to three pi over two, because you'd get six pi over four, which is three pi over two. And then you add another pi over four, which would give you seven pi over four. And then you add another pi over four, which would get you back to zero. Because if you add a pi over four to seven pi over four, that would give you to eight pi over four, which is two pi. Which means in the problem, we were given nine pi over four, which means if you add another pi over four to eight pi over four, we are right back here at pi over four, which means we've done a whole revolution and then some, and an extra pi over four. So that's counting radians. Just look at it if you had a watch, but like, pi over four, two pi over four, three pi over four, four pi over four, five pi over four, just go around like it's a clock, right? Okay, if counting radians isn't your thing, well, here's option two. If you have no idea if nine pi over four is over revolution and you don't understand counting radians, well then, just take nine pi over four, and convert it into degrees. And your pi's cancel, and let's see, you get nine over four times 180, and this would give me 405 degrees, which means, is that over a revolution? Yes, which means that this would become
the tangent of 405 degrees, which then becomes the tangent of 405 minus 360 because it went over revolution, which becomes the tangent of 45 degrees. And the tangent at 45 degrees, if you look at 45 degrees, tangent puts y over x. You should be referencing your unit circle. I'm not gonna help you with that, right? Tangent of 45 degrees puts y over x, and you should get an output of one. Okay, so that's one method. Method two, uh, it's actually fun, right? I'll call it two. Option two. Okay, option two kind of goes along with counting radians. So we know nine pi over four is over a revolution, but how do we know that in radians? Well, I mean, you saw, I counted, it went over three, it went over two pi radians. But another way to do it is take nine pi over four, and do the division. Make it four into nine pi. And how many times is four going to nine? Twice. How many times is four going to nine pi? Two pi times. And four times two pi is eight pi, which leaves me with the remainder of pi. And if you remember anything about long division, you write your answer as the quotient, two pi, plus your remainder of pi over your divisor of four. <clears throat> and now what we do with this information is we only care about the remainder. The remainder actually gives us the coterminal angle to nine pi over four. This is the coterminal angle that nine pi over four shares the terminal side with. So this two pi actually represents revolutions. And this pi over four is the coterminal angle. Which means all we have to do from this step is rewrite it as the tangent of pi over four, which is the same as the tangent of 45 degrees. So no matter what, however you wanna go about it, your answer will still be one. Okay, not bad. Let me get rid of all those circles. Circle, circle, circle. I'll leave that circle. So that's your other option, which I think works great for radians. Okay. Now, cosine of 33 pi over four. That's definitely over a revolution. We saw that nine pi over four went over a revolution. What do you think 33 pi over four is gonna be as a revolution? Now you can choose to do option one on here where you convert to uh, degrees, but that's, I don't think that's gonna work out here. Let me see. So if I do option one, you would take 33, And I would get, let me see, 33 over 4 times 180. I'd get 1485 degrees. And what you would keep doing from here is you would have to keep subtracting 360 degrees until you got back into the unit circle. So that wouldn't be too bad. So I guess we can explore option one. So let's subtract 360 degrees one time. And this will give me 
one, one, two, five. Then let's subtract 360 degrees two times. And that would give me 765 degrees. And then let's subtract 360 degrees three times. And you'd get 405. <laughs> And then let's subtract 360 degrees four times, and you get 45 degrees. That's what we're looking for, which means the cosine of 33 pi over four, which is now the cosine of 1485 degrees would share the same terminal side as 45 degrees, which means that cosine of 1485 and cosine of 45 are on the same terminal side. And now look at your unit circle, and the cosine of 45 degrees should be. square root 2 over 2. All right, that was option 1. Option 2, which I like a lot, maybe because it was just out of the box thinking. I don't know. Take the 33 pi over 4 and divide them. So 4 into 33 pi, and 4 goes into 33 pi, eight pi times. Four times eight pi is 32 pi, which leaves you with pi. Now remember from long division, you'll have your quotient plus your remainder over your divisor. And this is all we want, which means that this becomes the cosine of pi over 4, which is the same as 45 degrees, meaning we get the same answer of square root 2 over 2. Is it magic? Probably. But you see how either method works. There you go. <clears throat> so that's coterminal angles. <clears throat> Next is what do we have? Determine the sign to trig functions of an angle in a given quadrant. So if data is not a quadrant angle, then it will lie in a particular quadrant. In such a case, the signs of the x coordinate and y coordinate of a point AB on the terminal side of theta are known. So, all we're looking for here is where are your trig functions positive and negative? So, in quadrant one, let's go ahead and take a look. In quadrant one, we know everything is positive. So if you look at your chart for this first row, in quadrant one, sine and cosecant would be positive. It makes sense because they're reciprocals of each other. Cosine and secant would be positive. And tangent puts positive over positive. Cotangent puts positive over positive. So those would be positive as well. So everything in quadrant one is positive. And then look at quadrant two. In quadrant two, x is negative, y is positive. So in quadrant two, for the second row, sine and cosecant would both be positive. 
cosine and secant would both be negative. And then tangent and cotangent. Tangent would put positive over negative. Cotangent would put negative over positive, which means you'd still get negative. And then in quadrant three, everything's negative. So sine and cosecant would be negative. Cosine and secant would be negative. But tangent and cotangent would put negative over negative, meaning we get positive. And then quadrant four, where x is positive, y is negative. Well, in quadrant four, sine and cosecant would be negative. Cosine and secant would be positive. And tangent and cotangent would put negative over positive or positive over negative, which means you get negative. OK. So that's just an exercise in knowing where your trig functions are positive and negative at, which is very important to know. And now the next examples are what, uh, what is it? Find the quadrant in which an angle lies. So based on the sign of your trig function, what quadrant are we in? So this one says that if sine is less than zero and cosine is less than zero, meaning if sine is negative and cosine is negative, what quadrant are we in? And you can reference your chart. You can reference the unit circle. It says when sine is negative and cosine is negative, this means we must be in quadrant three. And then two says if sine is positive and cosine is negative, if sine is positive and cosine is negative, this means we must be in quadrant. And then, if cosecant is positive and cotangent is negative, well, let's look. Cosecant is positive and cotangent is negative, then we must be in quadrant two again. There it is. That's it. Just know what quadrant you belong to. All right. So next is the definition of a reference angle. Let theta denote the angle that lies in a quadrant. The acute angle, remember an acute angle is an angle between zero and 90 degrees, or zero and pi over two radians. The acute angle formed by the terminal side of theta and the x-axis is called the reference angle for theta. Okay, so. Let's see what that means. Let's draw some examples here. So once again, let's say I have my that's too big. Here's my initial side as always. And let's say I have an angle here in the second quadrant. So here is theta. Okay, so a reference angle is the acute angle formed by the terminal side and the nearest, well, I wanna say nearest axis, and the x-axis. That's the only axis. We can't do anything with the y. So a reference angle is formed by the terminal side and the x-axis. So the angle formed here, which I'm going to call alpha, that little fish looking symbol is alpha, is our reference angle. That's it, that's all the reference angle is. And the reference angle is between zero and 90, or zero and pi over two radians. That's all we're saying. 
And what we're saying with that as well is if you have theta and your reference angle, they will also share the same exact numerical values. Crazy, right? So it's kind of like coterminal. If you land on the same terminal side, you share the exact same value. If you have a reference angle, then you also share that exact same value. Your reference angle will share the exact same value as the value of theta you have. Okay. Let me draw another example. Let's see. Perfect. There's my initial side. <clears throat> and honestly, let's just put this one in the first quadrant. Here's theta. And this means that from my terminal side, back to the x-axis here is going to be my reference angle of alpha. That's it. That's all we're doing. And your reference angle will always be positive because it's between 0 and 90. Okay, so let's go ahead and find our reference angles for the given angles, 150 degrees. So this would be knowing exactly what quadrant your angle's in. So we're given 150 degrees, and I think I put a unit circle here to use. Now we can use this one. So if you look at your unit circle, and mine doesn't show degrees, but yours does, 150 degrees, should be in quadrant two. So we'll use that and I'll draw it down below. <clears throat> so here is my initial side, and then here is 150 degrees. Now, based on my <clears throat> unit circle, we know that 0, 90, 180, 270. So for my reference angle, it's the angle made by the terminal side and the x-axis. So there's my reference angle. And since it's between 0 and 90 degrees, basically all you have to say is how many degrees are left between 150 and 180. What is the difference of, degree, of degrees between those two values? And that means my reference angle is going to be 30 degrees. That's it. So 150 degrees and my reference angle of 30 degrees would share the same exact numerical value based off the unit circle. That's all we're saying. Let's try it for the next one. Negative 45 degrees. Well, 45 is in the first quadrant. Negative 45 must be below in the fourth quadrant. So let's draw that out. There's my initial side, and then down here, my terminal side. And this is your negative 45 degrees. Okay. 
Okay, which means for my terminal angle, actually, let me draw these again, 0, 90, 180, 270. So my term, my reference angle, to get back to the x-axis is saying what is the distance, what is the, how many degrees are left over from negative 45 to zero. Like if I'm at negative 45, how do I get back to zero? What should my reference angle be? And remember, it's always positive. So this means that to go from negative 45 back to zero, this means that alpha has to be a positive 45 degrees. That's it. Okay. And then last one, nine pi over four. Where'd we go? Oh, shot me all the way down there. Weird. Did it again. Stop it. Technical difficulties, Andy. Maybe if I clicked off somewhere. There we go. Okay. Okay. Now, let me do something here. Zero radians, pi over two, pi, and three pi over two. Okay, nine pi over four. Well, from the previous examples we've done, we know that nine pi over four is over a revolution. So if I drew nine pi over four on here, once again, there is my initial side. And we would do one revolution and stop there. This would be my nine pi over four. Now, <clears throat> we went over revolution, but remember that a reference angle has to be between zero and pi over two radians or 90 degrees. And for my reference angle, to get back from the terminal side to this x-axis, well, that's nine pi over four, and to get back to two pi, then I'm going to need alpha to be pi over four. That's it. That's how reference angles works. So, I mean, if I showed that up here in the regular unit circle, you would have your initial side, your revolution, and you end up there. That's your nine pi over four. And then to get back from the terminal side to the x-axis for my alpha, it's just gonna be pi over four units. That's it, to get back down there. That's why alpha is pi over four. That's it. Okay, yeehaw. <clears throat> An important note about reference angles. So in order for your reference angle to share the exact same value as the original angle, you must take note of what quadrant your reference angle is in. So if theta is an angle that lies in a quadrant, and if alpha is its reference angle, then sine of theta can equal positive or negative sine alpha 
cosine can be positive or negative cosine alpha. Basically, the rest of the functions can be plus or minus, all based on the quadrant that you're in. The plus or minus depends on what quadrant your angles lie in. Okay, so this is a practice using reference angles. So sine of 135. So I guess we can use our unit circle over here. I'll draw the diagram. And 135, if I have my initial side, then this is where 135 should go. <clears throat> and for my reference angle, we want to know how many degrees is left between 180, so over here, 180 degrees, how many degrees are left between 180 and 35? And that answer would be 45 degrees. So what we're going to do with that information is come back over here to the problem. And first thing we're going to note is that 135 is in quadrant 2. But in quadrant 2, sine is positive, right? which means that whatever the output for the reference angle is going to be has to be positive as well. So this means we get to rewrite sine of 135 using our reference angle of 45 degrees. Sine of 35 will become the sine of 45. And if you reference your unit circle, the sine of 45 degrees is square root 2 over 2, which also happens to be the sine at 135. The sine of 135 is also square root of 2 over 2. So this practice in reference angles is just showing you that a reference angle can share the exact numerical value as an original angle of theta given. So I don't know if this work makes work easier or it probably makes work harder, but a reference angle could come in handy because, yeah, sure, we could have said sine of 135 is square root of 2 over 2 a long time ago and been done with it. But again, we are here to practice reference angles, how to actually use them. Okay. So next practice is... 600 degrees, oh my goodness. So let me put this here. This is 180, 90, 0, 270, it's also 360. Okay, where is 600 degrees? Where is 600 degrees? Well, we can actually use both methods we learned today on this. First off, 600 degrees is definitely over a revolution. So we can first off by, or we can use the coterminal angle process to find out who shares a coterminal angle with 600 degrees. So that's where we'll go first. Why not? Use all the methods. So we can rewrite this as the cosine of 600 degrees minus 360 degrees. Let's hope that brings us back into the unit circle. And it will. This will give us the cosine of 240 degrees, which puts us back in the restrictions of the unit circle, 0 to 360. And 240 should be, let's see, that's 180. 210 and 240. So that should be right there, right? Let me see. Uh, so if I drew this, there's my initial side. And then here would be 240, because that'd be 2, we'd go 90, 
Actually, so yeah, my bet, 240 should be right there. Okay. So there's 240 degrees, and what we have to ask ourselves is, for the reference angle to get back to the x-axis, how many degrees is left between 240 and 180? Between 240 and 180, and that would be 60 degrees. So this means that alpha would be 60 degrees. But we have to take note that 240 degrees is in which quadrant? This is in quadrant three where cosine is negative. So this means that cosine of 240, since it's gonna be a negative value, is gonna become the negative cosine of our reference angle. There it is. And now, all we have to do is look at the cosine of 60 degrees, which is right here, and the cosine of 60 degrees is going to give me one half. But what's waiting on the outside? That negative. So this becomes negative one half. And once again, I'm sure we can get away with it without using a reference angle, but the practice was to use a reference angle because we could have been done with it using the coterminal process. We found that the same coterminal side would be at 240 degrees, which means that at 240 degrees, the cosine at 240 degrees is negative one half. But we're practicing using reference angles, which is probably making your life miserable. But hey, we're almost done with the examples. <laughs> Okay, last one for these. I'll leave that there. Cosine of 17 pi over six, that's definitely over a revolution. Definitely way over a revolution. So once again, use the coterminal process and we can say six into 17 pi and six goes into 17 pi, what is it, two times? Two pi times. And you'll get six times two pi gives me 12 pi, which gives me five pi. And this gives me two pi plus five pi over six. And this is what we're worried about using the coterminal process. So this means that cosine of 17 pi over six by the coterminal process becomes the cosine of five pi over six. And we can be done, but we have to use reference angles. I'm sorry. <laughs> so there's my initial side. Hey, look, there's five pi over six, right? All of that is five pi over six. And then, to use the reference angles, we know that to get from 5 pi over 6 back to the x-axis, what is the difference left from 5 pi over 6 to pi? And to make it easy, our answers should always be one of these three radians unless it's giving us a more complicated one like pi over 12 or pi over 15, majority of the time our answers are these. 
or it's 60 degrees, 45 degrees, 30 degrees. So to get from five pi over six back to the x-axis, it's gonna take a reference angle of pi over six radians. Which means we have to take note again of which quadrant five pi over six is in. I know, so much work, right? Five pi over six happens to be in quadrant two. And in quadrant two, cosine is negative. So this means that cosine of five pi over six becomes the negative cosine of pi over six. And we look at pi over six, and the cosine of pi over six is square root three over two, but we have a negative weighting on the outside, and you get negative square root three over two. And like I said, we could have been done a long time ago because all we had to look at was what was the cosine of five pi over six, and the cosine of five pi over six was the negative square root of three over two. But we were practicing reference angles. I know, the worst. <laughs> All right, so maybe that should be a hint for you that, hey, I can get away with just using coterminals instead of reference angles. And that's totally fine. Just know that they are both there to help you, unless reference angles is making your life worse. Oh yeah, let me say that this reference angle was 45 degrees. Okay. Last page. So find the exact value of the six trig functions and they're giving us one ratio already and some restrictions. This says if cosine is negative two thirds and theta is between pi over two and pi, find the remaining six trig ratios, or five trig ratios, they're already given us one. So, all we have to do here is first draw your coordinate plane slash unit circle and label it, because they're giving us restrictions in radians. So we know this is zero radians, pi over two radians, pi radians, and three pi over two radians. And what we're saying, what this restriction is saying is that theta is stuck between pi over two and pi. Theta is stuck between pi over two and pi, which means we are stuck in the, oops, second quadrant. So that's where our triangle will go. There we go. Where theta is going to be placed right here. And they're giving us cosine already. negative two thirds. Notice how I put the negative on the numerator. That is because if we're in quadrant two, cosine should be negative, which means the base is negative two. And cosine puts adjacent over a hypotenuse. And the hypotenuse is always positive, no matter what, should be three. And now, all we have to do is use Pythagorean theorem to find the last side. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and you get 
a squared plus the base, which is four, plus the equal to the hypotenuse of nine. And then you move the four over <clears throat> and you'll get a squared equals five. And therefore, a is the square root of five. So that'll go there. <laughs> and you can call that a special right triangle if you want. A two, three, square root of five triangle. Why not? <clears throat> All right, four, nine, just making sure I did it right. Five. All right. So. Now you know all three sides of this triangle, you can find the remaining six trig functions. So this means that sine of theta will be square root five over three. And then, let me change that, let's say tangent of theta is going to put opposite over adjacent, so square root five over negative two. And if you have these three, there is no need to look at your triangle anymore because secant theta is gonna be negative three halves. Cosecant theta is gonna be three over the square root of five, but you must rationalize and it becomes three root five over five, and cotangent, you must rationalize as well. You flip it over and you'll get negative two square root five over five. And there it is, that's it. So just know what quadrant you're in based on the information given. Here we're given restrictions that we're stuck between pi and pi over two. So this means we must be in quadrant two. Okay. Last one. Do the same thing, draw our graph. And this says tangent is negative and sine is negative. Well, here sine is positive, tangent's positive. Here, tangent is negative, but sine is positive. Here, everything's negative except for tangent. And then here, Cosine's positive, sine's negative, and tangent would be negative. So sine being negative would be in the fourth quadrant or the third quadrant, but since tangent's negative, we must be in the fourth quadrant. So based on the signs and the information given, we know where to put our triangle. And that's going to go right there. Theta goes right there. And tangent, they're giving us is negative 4. So they're saying tangent is negative 4. Well, remember, tangent puts opposite over adjacent. So if I made this into a fraction, four over one, which part would be negative, the numerator or the denominator? And remember, tangent puts opposite over adjacent. Well, if we're in the fourth quadrant, this opposite should be negative, and this adjacent should be positive. So this means that the numerator is going to be negative 4, and the denominator is going to be positive 1. And then, by Pythagorean theorem, you'll get a squared plus b squared 
equal to c squared, and you'll get four squared, negative four squared plus one squared equal to c squared, and you'll get 17 equal to c squared. You get the square root of 17 is c. So there is your hypotenuse. Now, find the, re find the remaining five functions. So we'll say cosine of that theta. We'll put one over the square root of 17, which you must rationalize into square root 17 over 17. Sine, we'll put <clears throat> opposite over hypotenuse, which you will rationalize as negative four square root of 17 over 17. Okay. And then, like I said, you don't have to look at your triangle anymore if you know the reciprocal functions. So this means that cotangent will just be negative one fourth. Secant will be 17 over the square root of 17, or that's just going to be square root 17. And cosecant is going to be 17 over negative 4 square root 17. Ugh. Or you'll get negative square root 17 over 4. And there it is. That is 7.4. Probably everything was great until reference angles, right? But this is how you utilize uh, coterminal angles, reference angles, and know the signs of your quadrants. Know what quadrant you're in based on the information given. All right, that is it. Till the next one.